and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. What is the definition of insanity doubling down on a conspiracy theory? And why Russia may be the key to peace on the Korean Peninsula? Cross-talking some real news, I'm joined by my guest here in Moscow, Dmitry Babich. He's a political analyst with Sputnik International. And in Nicosia, we cross to Alexander Christoforo. He is the director and writer for the Duran.com. All right, gentlemen, cross-talk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Let me go to uh, Cyprus first. Uh, uh, Alex, I, I really have to uh, say, watching the panels, endless panels on CNN and MSNBC, it looks like a psychiatric, a psychiatric ward, and they're all going through some kind of group therapy. Uh, they, can't, they can't even get past denial. Um, so they're doubling down. That's what I'm calling this program. Your reaction? Yeah, Peter, I, you know, I really hope that they release an unredacted Mueller report, because you had the first time that they, that they suffered this breakdown, which was when Barr gave his four or five page summary. They couldn't accept it. Now they have the redacted Mueller report a month later, and they still can't accept no collusion, no obstruction. I really, really hope, Peter, that they release a third report so we can call the next uh, crosstalk triple down, because they won't accept anything other than, you know, Taking taking Trump out of the White House yep. in an orange jump, jumpsuit in handcuffs. Well, I mean, they've lost their mind. Yes, but Alex, there will there certainly will be more reports. But it's going to be the other shoe dropping. It'll be very interesting how they cover those reports. There, Dima, is it is it just part of the business model? I mean, they they, they don't know what else to do other than attack the president of the United States. There's many reasons to attack Donald Trump and his administration and many of his policies. But this isn't it. They can't let it go. It's, 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 a, it's a Stockholm syndrome playing well, out. Uh, you're right about group therapy, therapy but also there are uh, kinds of propaganda. And, and the simplest propaganda is an assertion. You just say that something happened and, and people are basically gullible. They want to believe what they, they hear. That's right. It's a cult. It's, 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 a, it's, cult. A, it's, a, it's a secular religion for them already. Absolutely. And, and, and look uh, at uh, what this uh, report actually says about the Russian intelligence, about the Gayeru. It's an assertion, you know. Gayeru hacked uh, DNC server and passed this but information. Vla Vladimir Putin had an uh, antipathy towards Hillary Clinton. How, yeah. how do we know these things? They never tell well, us. Any if of these someone things. calls you Hitler, uh, compares you to Hitler, if someone compares your country to the Third Reich, I think you would be an idiot not to feel antipathy to this person, right? Well, so, and it's <laughs> also called First Amendment. But okay? whose fault is that? I think uh, if someone uh, calls a person Hitler without any apparent reason for them, uh, and this person feels antipathy to, to the insulter, that's the problem of the insult. It's not the problem of the person who gets yeah, insulted. And, 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 and that's right. And, and they initiated this here. Let me but, go back to the, go back to Cyprus here. What I find very curious about this report, it, it, Mueller actually gave the Democrats and tr the Never Trumpers a way out. These ten theories about obstruction. I find it very strange because he did an investigation, and it goes one way or another: indictments or no indictments. This addendum is really what's going to keep. Uh, the Democrats and the Never, Never Trumpers uh, that keep them uh, uh, satiated for the next two years because they don't know what else to do. Uh, they're so invested in this ridiculous hoax that they have to keep it going because if they don't, they have to admit they were wrong, and these people don't have the moral caliber to admit they're wrong. Alex. Yeah, Mueller did give them some, some fuel to fire this hoax for may, maybe all the way up until 2020, Peter. But I mean, the second part of the Mueller report. All it really was saying was that Trump is angry. Got angry. That they're, yeah, he's angry that they're investigating him for a crime that no one knows what that crime is. So, I mean, they're investigating him for something that no one understands happened. A lot of assertions, like Dima said, a lot of assertions, and Trump is just, you know, mulling around the White House upset. That's the entire second part of the report. And here comes Barr. Here comes Barr, who's going to do what Trump promised in 2016, Peter. Barr is going to drain the swamp. And the optics, the optics of that press conference, and we've talked about it many times, 
was Barr taking control in a very calm manner, and who was behind him like a deer that has just seen bright <laughs> headlights, Mr. Rod Rosenstein. Rod Rosenstein was brought to heel, and you could see it in his face. Yeah, that's a very good point. But Dima, you know, from our perspective on our side of the pond here, Mueller comes to the conclusion that there was no collusion, but it damaged U.S.-Russia relations amazingly so, almost to the point of irreparable. So there is a consequence. So we have a fake, we have a hoax conspiracy, but we have real policy changes that are very, very dangerous. Even. Well, it's not only $35 million that were spent on Mueller's commission, and that is taxpayers' money. The real damage is much greater, because not only do we have the sanctions, uh, and the, the mutual sanctions between Russia, the United States, and the EU, Europe. they have cost the EU at least $100 billion. That's according to uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the case. But add to this the increased military spending, uh, you know, the, the direct uh, damage from damaged uh, U.S.-Russia trade relations. Add to that increased tensions uh, with China, you know, which were indirectly heightened by, by all of this. Add to this the tensions in the Middle East. That's terrible. And why did all of this start? Because of Christopher Steele's dossier. And, and I, I was just amazed, you know, that is yesterday's Wall Street Journal, uh, that is Wall Street Journal from the last week. After two years of, investi uh, of investigation, hundreds of interviews and dozens of indictments, Mr. Buehler appears to have called into question Christopher Steele's assertions finding no evidence that <laughs> Russia possessed a tape of Mr. Trump watching <laughs> prostitutes perform lewd acts in Moscow. Well, uh, assertion. Wow. Alexander Christopher, let me go back to you. Assertions here. It doesn't even reach the level of assertions, okay? I mean, here we go. Here we have this, this fake dossier, this, this fairy tale. It is used for Pfizer warrants, and then you have Jim Comey in January 2017 saying, it is salacious and unverified, but it was useful enough in front of a FISA court. This is what Barr is going to show us. We already know it. He's going to give us the evidence. He's going to connect all the dots. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, you, you know, they hardly even mentioned the Christopher Steele report in, in, in the Mueller, you know, the final report. They hardly mentioned the dossier. This thing, like Dima said, 30, 35 million. They could have solved this entire case. They could have cracked this case, Peter, with $1,000. All they needed to do was get on a plane, go to London, go to the Ecuador embassy, you got interview it. Assange. You got maybe it. Maybe cut a deal with him. You got it. Extra. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, so extradite Steele, bring him to the U.S. Not extradite Assange to the U.S. Extradite Steele, bring him to the U.S., question him. It's over. Then you understand exactly what happened. The whole thing is one big farce. It's all built on lies. And they lied the whole way through. Peter, four months BuzzFeed has had on their site. They've had on their site the, the, the entire, the, Mike, Michael Tracy pointed it out that they had to retract the entire story that they were pushing about the, the Moscow hotel room, about, about, you know, making Cohen lie, that Trump, you know, prompted Cohen to lie to the FBI. All these things, they quietly retracted it, and Michael Tracy pointed it out on his Twitter four months later. You know, it's, Dima, it's very interesting is that we're constantly, in, in our position in this, our opinion, our approach to it, is that we are focused on facts, but we have the other side. Again, I go to the beginning of the program, the, the psych wards on CNN mm -hmm. and MSNBC. They're driven purely by hatred and emotion. Facts get in their way. That's why they don't use them. Well, uh, the first method of propaganda is assertion, and the second is bandwagon. Everyone is saying it. I mean, this is the whole idea. How can Wall Street Journal not publish something in it when the Washington Post is publishing it, the New York Times is publishing it? Well, they all published fake information on Saddam Hussein's having weapons of mass destruction. This is the same story, but carried to the U.S. soil. And, and the whole problem is that uh, if uh, Saddam Hussein, probably Saddam Hussein had even better investigators than Mr. Mueller, they would not need uh, <laughs> hundreds of indictments to crack 
a, basically a yellow press story, you know, about these prostitutes. But, but the problem is that the, uh, the American media and the American government would ignore it. They just couldn't ignore Mueller because they have been heaping praise on him for, for, uh, for many months. And, and look how they're basically abusing the reporters, the journalists. It appears to have debunked the report's claims that Michael Cohen, uh, Trump's uh, uh, attorney, clandestinely met with Kremlin officials in Prague to coordinate hacking with Russian officials, end of quote. But they sent several reporters to Prague. But, but, they stayed but, but there for even, several but weeks just looking look at for the, it. the language that you just, just repeated right there. It appears... Yes. I mean, really, it appears. Yeah. Really, yeah. okay. It, this is this is what I'm getting to. Let me let me go back to Alex uh, in Cyprus here. It, it's really interesting here. If you look at Mueller as a as a uh, an, uh, political actor here, it's really quite remarkable that he was Saint Mueller. Now he's Demon Mueller. You had Jim Comey, you know, the sainted one, then the demonized one. Everybody that gets involved in this, hopefully. Barring bar, no pun intended, th that we'll get past it because of him. Because anyone that jumps into this is, is just grinded away. Okay, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. Yeah, the, that's a great point, Peter. And the media has already turned on Barr. Yeah. But you know, Barr, we've discussed this many times. Barr doesn't need he his does, job. He has he's already nothing done to this lose. Job. He's got nothing to lose. Exactly. He has nothing to lose. So he's doing this out of a higher purpose, out of a higher calling. And Peter, mark my words. I know you, you, you probably think the same way. Rod Rosenstein knows where the bodies are buried. Rod and, Rosenstein and is going to this, tell Barr what's going on. This is on. going to be the material of another program, which you will be on, because we've already exactly. discussed it, and we're still connecting our dots here. Last 10 seconds. Go ahead, Dima. Well, uh, I would uh, point your attention to the fact that the Nazis also used bandwagon. The whole nation says yes, yes, yes. at the elections of 1934. <laughs> the whole American media is dismayed okay, by William Barr. We're going to go to a break here. I want to thank <laughs> Alexander um, uh, Christopher for joining us in Cyprus. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on real news. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing some real news. And now to London, where we're joined by Marcus Papadopoulos. He's the editor of Politics First magazine. Marcus, thank you for joining us today. Um, you suggested me we do a segment on North Korea, and I'm very glad we did. Uh, I hope that Mike Pompeo is watching to find out how, how he may be able to return to North Korea to lead the American delegation, because apparently he's persona non grata. The, the North Koreans accused him of being talking nonsense and showing a lack of maturity. Well, he's been doing that all over the globe. Where we stand with North Korea. Go ahead. Well, because there is a forthcoming meeting between Kim Jong un and Vladimir Putin, this constitutes a real opportunity for Russia to resurrect its Soviet era predominance in North Korea. Because as I talk now, relations between North Korea and China are waning. From the late 1940s to the mid 1980s, Russia was, was North Korea's most important partner, but under Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin, relations between Russia and North Korea deteriorated because both men favoured relations with South Korea. And of course, China took advantage of that. But in 2019, China now regards North Korea as somewhat of a form in its side in its trade relationship with America. So enter Russia. What can Russia gain? Russia can gain a lot of economic benefits in North Korea, for example, building civilian infrastructure, bridges, et cetera, et cetera. But also there is a geostrategic imperative for Russia because the Americans, as they are doing in Eastern Europe, are trying to surround Russia in the Far East, surrounding them with bases. But also South Korea is host 
to an American missile system which is aimed at Russia's strategic nuclear deterrence. So if Russia can become, again, the predominant outside force in North Korea, then Russia will be able to counter the American, the growing American military threat on its borders in the Far okay, East. Okay, Marcus, you already mentioned South Korea. Um, uh, Russia and China have come out with um, uh, blueprints, um, uh, uh, roadmaps uh, to resolve the standoff on the peninsula. And, and they're long standing, okay? And, they're, and I think they're very viable here. So you mentioned South Korea. Russia has a good relationship with South Korea as well. And we know that the, it's the South Koreans um, in after in the wake of the failed Hanoi summit, which I believe was intentionally sabotaged by John Bolton and Mike Pompeo and people like that. Um, this is an opening to, uh, to deal with North and South Korea simultaneously. As, as I said in my introduction, the peninsula, they're looking at the entire peninsula. Go ahead and comment on that. Well, yes, it's absolutely correct. In the last 25, 30 years, Russia has developed a very cordial relationship with South Korea, and that is good for peace on the Korean Peninsula. That is good for peace in the general region. However, the problem is that, like Turkey, South Korea is a strategic ally of the Americans, and that is not going to change. And that is why the South Koreans, to the disgust of the Russians a few years ago, agreed to host uh, an American missile system. So that is why, despite Russia having good relations with Seoul, it is absolutely imperative for Russia to fill the vacuum which is being created in North Korea, because China is starting to distance itself. And if Russia can do that, then it will help to secure its security in the Far East, because the American presence is growing considerably there. Okay, Dima, go ahead, comment on what we've talked about well, so far. Well, uh, I agree with Marcus. I think that basically uh, there is a big challenge behind all of this, which is a challenge for Russia, for China, for North Korea, and uh, for a lot of countries in the region. Because what was the idea behind Mr. Trump's exiting uh, the INF Treaty, the Intermediate and Medium Range Missile Treaty? It, it was primarily not about Europe. It was about Southeast Asia, you know. INF prevents the United States from having their medium-range missiles in Southeast Asia, because they are too close to the former Soviet Union, to Russia. So the, the, Trump wants to scrap the treaty in order to deploy the missiles in South Korea, in Japan, basically targeting China. And this is the reason why China is even more opposed to scrapping the INF treaty than Russia. And, and this is a challenge which both Russia and China sh should face. But, but, you know, but I guess nobody has any bright lights in, 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 uh, in the Washington consensus, because it seems to me that maybe they should have had an international agreement on these missiles and it would have been resolved in a completely well, the, different the, way. The, the difficulties are going to be huge uh, and uh, maybe even bigger than we can envision now, because, in fact, relations between the Soviet Union and North Korea were pretty bad between 1964 yeah. and 1985 because North Korea supported Maoist China. Uh, they improved in the mid-80s, and then in 1989, Gorbachev recognized South Korea, sorry, in 1988. And, and, and uh, there was, a, again, a certain cooling of relations. But still, uh, Russia is the only country which South Korea and North Korea at least partially trust, because you cannot trust Mike Pompeo, you cannot trust Mike well, Pence. And, and Russia is a neighbor. It's a, Russia the neighbor. Is a neighbor, and 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 uh, the reason why South Korea is driven towards Russia is because, uh, okay, Mike Pence can uh, afford a war on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea cannot. cannot. Okay. Japan Mark, cannot. Marcus, let me go back to you. I mean, they're they're mulling. We're hearing for, uh, from the administration the possibility. Uh, of another summit. I mean, after the train wreck called Hanoi, well, what, what's the point and what would be different? Because the U.S. seems to have this knee-jerk reaction to anything. It's always a, to a maximalist position. Uh, surrender and then we can talk. Well, there's no way in the world North Korea is ever going to do that. And we've said this on this program for years. Go ahead, Marcus, in London. Uh, let me quickly just say something. Relations between North Korea and China actually deteriorated in the 1960s. But returning to the present, do you know, Peter, 
I actually don't believe that the last meeting between Trump and Kim Jong-un was actually a failure because the fact that an American president and a North Korean leader are actually sitting at the same table... Well, fair with fair, one, fair enough, taken, fair enough. Is, that, that, is something to celebrate. that is something to rejoice. And, you know, go back to the 1990s when Bill Clinton was considering a military strike against North Korea. What did his general say? In an event of an, a war between North Korea and America, the American military would sustain something like 100,000 casualties. South Korean casualties would be something like one million. So I think we should rejoice that there have been meetings between Trump, uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un. Now, we have to talk about China in all of this. China finds itself in a very difficult situation because, yes, China is traditionally a close ally to North Korea, but at the same time, China is becoming embarrassed. When I speak to Chinese diplomats, they do feel somewhat embarrassed because of their relationship with North Korea, and the Americans are piling a lot of pressure yep. on China to use leverage over North Korea. And the Chinese do not want to do anything to jeopardize their trade relationship with America, and rightly so, because China's economic progress over the last 40 years has been built on the basis of its trade with America and its investments in America. So if push comes to shove, China will walk away from North Korea in order to maintain its relationship with America. And I do understand that, Peter. Yeah, Dima, mm. another interesting caveat here. I agree with Marcus completely. The, the, the fact that they're talking is, is very important considering mm. history here. But Donald Trump has really owned this. This mm. is his. I mean, it, it's not, this issue isn't something that uh, uh, is going to be resolved because of the underlings around him, again, the Boltons and the Pompeos. Mm. But he has taken this on board. Is that going to make a difference? I mean, because we see, you know, very strange policy changes in Syria and Libya, and this thing, this is the thing that Trump has owned. This is what he wants his Nobel Prize for. Well, uh, is that enough? Is that going to, I mean, considering these other issues going on, I, I just don't have a lot of confidence there. I'm pretty skeptical. I agree with Mark, uh, Marcus that uh, it's very important that uh, Kim Jong Un had this meeting with Trump, but who was against the deal? It was the American liberal media, you know. It was Rachel Maddow oh, and Oh, my others. God, peace could break out. Oh, peace yeah. could break out. Well, they, they suspected Trump of, uh, of being soft uh, to Kim Jong-un, of supporting a totalitarian dictatorship, all of that nonsense. We have been hearing it not from the Republicans, not from the hawks, but from the supposed dogs, from the peaceniks, you know, people who uh, proclaim themselves like Rachel Maddow just a few years ago, she proclaimed herself to be a pacifist, basically. They, they, they will do everything to scrap a possible deal between the United States and North Korea. And I tend to agree with some critics of Trump uh, that basically he just likes to be photographed next to celebrities. And Kim Jong-un is a sort of celebrity. So we remember how Trump tried to get as much publicity out of it as possible, you know, meeting Kim Jong-un in, in Singapore, in Hanoi. Well, but, 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 but that's why results, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have to get some results here. Well, and that's, and considering, I, I, even though I agree that the leaders are talking, the, the policy really hasn't changed. And North Korea and has made it very clear. I think they've given a deadline to the end forget, of this year. Let's Go not ahead. forget that right at this moment, millions of people are suffering because the sanctions against North Korea, they included not only weapons, but also fuel, you know. So people in North Korea are suffering without fuel. And this is something that we need to remember. That's much more important than the photo ops of Mr. Trump. All right, all let me that. jump in. I want to give Marcus the last 40 seconds. Go ahead, Marcus. Well, I think when it comes to North Korea and America, we mustn't have unrealistic expectations. Both countries have been at each other's throats, so to speak, for well over 50 years. We must rejoice in the fact that they are now talking with each other, though we must also recognize this. The reason why Trump is at the table is because North Korea has nuclear weapons. If Venezuela yeah. had nuclear weapons, then, of course, Trump would not be threatened in Venezuela as we speak now. Absolutely wonderful point here. Last word? Absolutely right. And I think that... Uh... I hope that the treatment of the, by the United States of North Korea will not induce other countries, 
smaller countries to get nuclear weapons, because this is well, the conclusion I, that a lot well, of you, countries well, may take from it. Well, you just opened up a can of worms there. We could talk about a <laughs> nuclear Saudi yeah, Arabia, so another nightmare scenario. That's all the time, gentlemen, we have. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow, London, and in Cyprus. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, crosstalk rules.